Scotland, and uh, she did her original work in marine biology at Harriet Watt and has kind of moved through the horizon. So she's really seen the entire spectrum of conservation to development, and I'm very pleased that she's here to share with us. And I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I just want to and that's where you're supposed oh, to stand. Up here, oh, if anybody is a speaker, there's an ah. X. You're supposed to stand on the black X so that you can see your screen and so that the video can see you. So, uh, Excellent. And if I move from the spot, let me know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> away this. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed last night, those of you who went to the dinner, and um, to when you saw heads this morning. Um, so, as uh, Mary Weather said, um, I went for a big, massive engineering and environmental consultancy, uh, AMF Foster Wheeler. We have about 40,000 people worldwide, and I tried to find out how many offices we have, but I can't remember, something like 200 offices or so. So sometimes you can feel like a little tiny cog in the wheel, which is a bit depressing, but we do work with some very fantastic, some very good big projects as well, so um, it's quite good to see the process developing fr right from the very beginning of a project through to consenting and then even maybe post-consent monitoring and a construction. Um, I just wanted to say um, uh, the what you're talking about with the rigs, uh, like rigs to reef, or do we take them out and everything, that is a very topical discussion, very topical conversation at the moment, um, which would be great to um, catch up afterwards, so that would be good, yeah. So, right, what I'll be discussing today, essentially, is uh, the not so glamorous and not so exciting subject about marine planning and about um, gaining consents, obtaining consents for big major infrastructures or even small infrastructures. Um, in the UK, particularly recently, we've got a lot of development going on. We've got all your offshore wind farms, you know, your round one, two, three, all the various extensions of wind farms. Uh, new nuclear bills in uh, 2011, the government um, basically put an energy policy ahead and designated eight sites, I believe, around the UK for new nuclear builds, um, places like Hinkley, Sizewell, Moorside, uh, coastal sea defences, marinas, ports, jetties, and so on. Um, as technology increases, as technology gets better, um, we are now building more and more offshore, we're building more coastally and getting even further out offshore. Um, the one thing to stress here is it's expensive building out at sea. Um, there's a reason why I'm saying this, but um, for example, take uh, David's talk yesterday uh, from the RSPB. He mentioned that it takes four million pounds just to put a breach in a seawall and then build another seawall around this guy's land and flood it, and that's only a small development. So you can imagine with these big massive offshore developments just how much it can cost. Um, now, because of this, we end up getting challenges uh, well, we face challenges um, during the pre-consent phase, so that's when you do your environmental impact assessments and your habitat regulation assessments, or appraisal, as they're known up here in Scotland. Um, and uh, all these challenges and all these issues that can arise can have severe consequences upon the development. Uh, they can delay developments, or they can even stop a development from going ahead. Um, particularly if you have an overly precautionary approach to the environmental impacts. Now, kind of, I, I like to think of myself as a conservationist, even though I'm an environmental consultant, but it's, it's sometimes being too overly precautionary can have a negative influence, um, uh, which, uh, yeah, can have negative consequences, essentially. So, just as an example, I'm going to talk quickly about Docking Shoal and Race Bank, offshore wind farm. These were developed by Centrica, uh, commissioned, oops, well, AMEC, who were commissioned as the EIA consensus manager. Uh, Docking Shell was proposed 500 megawatt offshore wind farm, was in the outer wash, one of three Centrico wind farms. It applied for consent in 2009, and in 2012, consent was refused. Now, this consent was refused on the ground of cumulative um, impacts on collisions for birds, particularly, particularly sandwich terns, which resided on nearby SBA. Now, this was the first time that an offshore wind farm was denied consent, and not only that, it was the first time that an offshore wind farm was denied consent for a biological threshold, which was your, or your sandwich terms. Um, the other two, well, that one was chosen uh, because it had a higher collision effect per megawatt installed, it's uh, positioned to the SCA, 
and consent to the remaining two, which have still provided the uh, megawatt capacity for development. Um, so since then, since then, there have been some several studies um, looking into these issues um, that are now being faced by these offshore installations, um, particularly your renewables, which are a bit of a more novel technology um, than, for example, your oil and gas rigs that have been there since the 60s. Um, so what I was thinking of doing for this talk was I was going to use a small study that we did for the Crown Estate back in 2013 where we were asked to look at cumulative impact assessment issues surrounding the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters wave and tidal energy devices, or energy zones. Um, it was a small study we did for the Crown Estate. Essentially, they did not want a repetition of these challenges and issues that um, all the other uh, industries were facing, and they wanted to try and smooth the way for developers and to get like harmony between the developers and the regulators. Um, but the issues that arose from this study, and from several other studies that were done at the same time, um, all pretty much had the same outcome and can be applied across the whole gamut of impact assessment, not just cumulative. Right, so just a quick, um, for those who don't know, with the Pentland Firth and Ockley Waters, um, these yellow ones are the wave energy zones, and the grey ones are the tidal zones. Um, so, basically, the experience from other industries has shown that cumulative impact assessments um, can provide significant challenges to consenting, as we've seen from Docking Shop. The uncertainties over these potential cumulative impact assessments can also lead to significant delays or not even any consent. Um, this was particularly the case with um, wave and tidal energy devices. They're very novel in nature and um, there was a lot of uncertainty over what impacts these, uh, this novel technology can have. Okay. So the main aim of our project was um, several. We wanted to facilitate discussions between regulators and developers, essentially get them in a room together, in a workshop, and get them to try and see eye to eye. Um, we wanted to um, use case studies from both terrestrial and marine in identifying if there's like common issues for cumulative impact assessments across all these different um, developments. And the objective at the end, so we developed a discussion paper which was then used in the workshop, um, which examined issues behind the CIA process, um, facilitated open discussions, and finally brought about uh, recommendations or a way forward. So first thing we did was we looked at what guidance there is out there, and there was quite a bit at the time. Um, I had, but when you read through all the guidance that, that there was there, they all said, okay, yes, you know, um, you've got development, you're going to make, put this, you're going to do the environmental impact assessment on this development, you have to do a cumulative impact assessment, and that's it. Um, yes, they wrote about, some of them had like 30 pages written on it, or 10 pages, but they didn't quite go into the nitty gritty or into the details of how to go about doing cumulative impact assessment. For example, so um, these, this is just a, basically a summary of um, what the stages and procedures are in a cumulative impact assessment. And it says, identify relative, relevant projects for inclusion into the CIA. Okay, right, relevant projects. What projects are these then? Um, identify spatial and temporal boundaries for CIA. Well, how, how are we going to go ahead and do those? Um, identify environmental receptors. That's a bit easier. That's not so, that wasn't so much of an issue. And quantification of significant cumulative effects is a quantification bit that proves a problem. And I'll explain why. Right, so if we look at the first one, how do we determine which projects to include in a cumulative impact assessment? Um, there was this one phrase that kept on cropping up. It crops up in the EC guidelines, uh, kept on cropping up in national guidelines. Um, include all projects that are reasonably foreseeable. 
well, what do we mean by reasonably foreseeable projects? So when you're doing a cumulative impact assessment, um, you've got your, your wind farm, your turbine that you're going to build. You've done your um, standard impact assessment on it. Now you have to see how it's going to interact with other developments. So which ones do we include? Do we include ones that projects that um, have submitted for an application? So there's quite a strong possibility that they're going to get built. Do we include ones that have submitted for a scoping opinion to the, um, to the regulators? Um, quite a few developments have not gone ahead even after they've submitted a scoping opinion. Again, nine times out of ten, it's due to monetary reasons. Or do we include projects, which happens quite a bit actually terrestrially this, whereby the regulators have said, oh, you know, this developer came to me and they sound really keen to build X, to build this other wind turbine over here. So I think you should include his development into the cumulative impact assessment. So just quick, yeah, so conflicts, there are conflicts between guidance documents, how do we define a project as reasonable, projects that intend to submit an application at the same time, and so on. As an example, when we did the Bosch HRA, it started with three projects in the CIA, ended up with five projects. The other thing is you have to define a time frame. You've got your projects, you're doing your impact assessment, and the very last minute, the regulator comes to you and says, oh, by the way, here's another project for you to put in that delays um, getting consent by another two months. They come again by another three months, by another four months, and so on and so forth. So we tried to come up with a potential solution and said, right, <coughs> projects where you have a consent application that's submitted or under construction, one that's put in a scoping report, whereby because it's a scoping report, you don't have the details of the project as such or any of the data that are collected, so it can only be a qualitative assessment. And operational projects, as much as possible, include them in the baseline, not in the cumulative impact assessment. Then we said, when should scoping take place? Okay. Do it too early, you've got no detail. Do it too late, no time or flexibility. So we said, okay, we'll try to do it as early as practicable. With a cutoff date of three to six months, I should say. I don't know where the months went. Um, and so on and so forth. We came up with more issues and more challenges to try and address. What well, of the regulators have differing advice, uh, particularly we're going across um, national or international boundaries. What about the spatial scale? Um, how far are you going to look at a project? Uh, temporal scale. Which receptors to include? And particularly data acquisition analysis. That's quite important. Um, jumping off to Northern Ireland over here. We did the habitat regulation assessment at plan level for Northern Ireland's Offshore Renewable Energy Strategic Action Plan. Bit of a mouthful. Um, so I was looking at these tidal zones over here. Now Zach Rex, we're going to have tidal devices here. So what's, ne what's nearby? Okay, we've got rivers designated for migratory salmonids and freshwater pearl mussels. Okay, so is there going to be an impact on salmonids? Um, where did the salmon go? Okay, so we know they go up this river, we know they go off to sea, but which path did they take out to sea? So, did my usual Google literature search and everything, and uh, couldn't find anything. I was like, okay, no worries, let's flip it around on its head. Worst case scenario, salmon do swim in this, um, through there, maybe, to go off into the, uh, into the Atlantic. Right, so if they swim through this passage and there's tidal turbines there, how are they going to react to the tidal turbines? Is it going to be attraction, avoidance behavior? Is it going to confuse their migratory passage? Again, do a Google search. At the time, hmm, no details either. Right, okay, so um, how am I as a consultant going to advise or make recommendations as to whether there's going to be a likely significant effect upon migratory salmonids of Northern Ireland's SACs? So, Again, data, data acquisition. This has been recognized as that we have lack of data in it and studies have been made up on it. But at the time, we were being asked to do this HRA. 
So what do we do? Do we say, oh, well, we don't know, so therefore you can't go ahead with it? You know, that, that's a big chunk of Northern Ireland's revenue now coming in. Um, other key things we came up with? Communication is key between developers and regulators. Whenever practicable, you want to do um, quantitative cumulative impact assessment should be undertaken. When not possible, then qualitative. There has to be consistency in data collection and analysis. Um, this particularly goes towards your modeling, physical modeling. Try and use the same models, the same calibration, same data, so that they can be um, um, compared across the board. Um, and again, achieved through developer collaboration and communication. And finally, a bit of food for thought. Um, project issue, project related issues versus strategic regional issues. Um, what bit is a government's responsibility and what bit becomes a developer's responsibility? And finally, going back to my overly precautionary approach, well, we should really challenge that because we should not let, well, well whilst I agree completely with a precautionary principle, um, <coughs> we should challenge being too overly precautionary, even legally maybe, um, rather than use it as an excuse to abandon scientific principle. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of questions to Alexia and uh, a lot of interesting reflections.